ourselves up and going. All right. So last time we got through, I think we were. Oh, and if you go, no, oh, I'm sorry. The, um, that little error was. I did take you the last one. Yeah, yes, of course. Yeah, no, just remembering where I was up to. Yeah, yep. okay. Good, perfect. Cool. All right. So, just to quickly remind you, the data set was about um, looking at the beetles versus the Rolling Stones, and we were looking at, um, we first looked at some multivariate, so shape centre spread, making the call. And we looked at, was there any difference on the um, time spent, the number of weeks they were on the charts. Yep. Then we looked at the, bi we finished last time looking at the bivariate one. Um, so that was looking at a graph of how many weeks they were on the chart and their position, and looking for what kind of relationship there was between that. All right. So that's where we've got to. So the next part is now I've got a couple more bits of information. Um, but also we want to now kind of put this all together as a whole. Okay, so when we're looking at data analysis, often you just get given a graph, interpret that. But in actual fact, these graphs are coming from a much bigger data set, and we want to understand the entire data set. And this is what's going to one of the things that will get us through to our insights, okay, as we are able to combine all of this information. So the previous one, so this first graph that we've got here, um, the number of weeks on the billboard 100. Um, so that's our first graph that we looked at. Then, then we've got the scatter graph that we looked at. And then now we've got a third graph here. Um, so this is now looking at the peak position on the charts. All right. And that's comparing the beetles with the rolling stones. So what we want to be able to do now is Bert's question is were the beetles or the rolling stones a more successful band? So we need to think about, well, what does successful mean? Yeah, what do we mean by that? And I've got data about the time on the billboard. I've got time about the position on the billboard. I need to put all of this information together to think about what does successful mean? Yeah? So we know, if I think about this weeks on the billboard, the conclusion, if we remember our conclusion, we were looking to see is the median inside or outside the boxes of the other. And I think... Gosh, it's my terrible straight line drawings. I think they were inside, both of them are pretty much inside the box. Where am I? Mean of nine with an upper lower of eight. Yep, yeah, so that's inside, and that median of 10 is definitely inside. So both of those medians are inside the boxes. So, in terms of the overall conclusion for this one, um, we can't make the call. All right, we don't have enough evidence for that graph to say that the Beatles or the Rolling Stones spent more or less time on the charts. Yeah, individual songs did, but not as a whole, okay? Same idea that we want to apply to that peak position, all right? So we can say, well, there's our median, but draw that, God, my terrible drawing today, guys. <laughs> if I want to draw a nice straight line going down and a nice reasonably straight line going up, both of those medians are inside the boxes. So what does that mean? Could I make the call for this data set? No. So the data there is about the peak position. So it means that I can't, so I don't have enough evidence to say that the median p position for the Beatles tends to be higher or lower than the median time for the Rolling Stones. I haven't got enough evidence to be able to say that. The medians could be pretty close to each other. All right. I do know from my scatter graph though, yeah? Um, this, if, if one median is in a box but the other median is not, there could be a conflict. Absolutely. Absolutely. All it needs is for one median to be outside the box. And as long as one of them is outside, it means there is enough distance. You've got enough evidence that there's enough highest percentage of that data that's at lower or bigger than this percentage of data there. Yeah. So one or both medians outside the box and would have enough evidence. So then our third graph, our scatter graph that we've got, we found that there's definitely some kind of relationship going on there between um, how long they are on the charts and their peak position. All right. So I need to combine those three conclusions, if you like, together. All right. 
So what would you guys say? Who reckons that they could say that there is enough evidence that there's a difference that beetles or the Rolling Stones are better? Who'd be prepared to say, yeah, I, I think beetles or the Rolling Stones is better? Who thinks that we couldn't say that? Good. Excellent. Excellent. So that's one of the first things that we want to talk about, is we want to talk about the fact that both of these two graphs here um, do not give us enough evidence. We cannot make the call of either there being a difference for the time on the charts or the position on the charts. All right, so that's the first thing that we want to be able to say is an overall statement. All right. Oh, and I need to write that actual writing pen. Um, so we want to be able to say overall we do not have um, enough evidence that um, there is a significant difference um, between the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Um, and so that's kind of overall, I'm just making an overall statement. Now I need to give some evidence to back that up. That's what I need for my merit. Um, so I can't say that there's enough evidence of a difference because um, for both the time on the charts and the peak position, Um, the medians are too close together. And being specific about the, the specific thing that I looked for, I was specifically looking for whether the medians were inside the boxes. All right, so that's, that's that specific justification I want for the merit. Um, both medians side each other's boxes. Okay. So that's one sentence, just giving an overall conclusion about what I think in terms of those particular graphs. But we know from that third graph that there is definitely some kind of relationship between these things, isn't there? There's a negative non-linear relationship between the time on the chart and the peak position. So because we have got that negative relationship, it's not surprising that if one of those pieces of data sets, the time on the charts, if that doesn't have a significant difference between the Beatles and Rolling Stones, it's also likely that the other one won't have a relationship because these two variables, time on the charts and peak position, those two variables are related together. So if there isn't evidence on one, it's quite likely that there isn't enough evidence on the other either. Yeah? So we want to be able to talk something about that relationship um, and what that relationship means in terms of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Okay. Um, so I might make myself a little note that um, the scatter graph shows um, that there is a negative non-linear, um, now what was the strength of that? I'll probably go with moderate strength, moderate relationship between um, the time of the charts and the position. So, and so that's kind of just stating overall, that's what the relationship is. Um, I'm not going to go into the details and justifying it, um, because we've already done that one of the previous questions, but what I do want to do is I want to make the connection between this 
and the actual question itself. The question is asking is, do I think one or other is more successful? So I need to connect that piece of knowledge to whether or not I think they're more successful. Okay, so because um, how am I going to word that? Because they are related. Um, this shows, or not shows, this implies that the relationship is about music overall, as opposed to just the Beatles or just the Rolling Stones. So this relationship is more about music than any songs and the time it spends on the charts and the time its position is. The relationship is more due to that population as opposed to this particular sample of the Beatles or the Rolling Stones. Okay, um, So it implies that the relationship is about music overall, um, not just specifically um, the Beatles or and the Rolling Stones. Now that comment also, because I'm then taking a step back out into the bigger picture of this data, this is essentially trying to tell the story, okay? And that's one of the things that we want for that excellence is to looking at that telling the story and saying, well, what is going on, all right? Um, and so I would expect, if I took other groups, yeah, doesn't matter whether it's the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, I would still expect for any music that I would get this kind of negative relationship for any brand of music. If I take all music, pop the time on the charts, pop the peak position, I would expect to see that similar relationship. Okay. The difference with these graphs, though, if I was comparing two individual other groups, and so not just the Beatles and Rolling Stones, but pick two other bands, okay, or two individuals, there may be quite a difference. All right. If I pick, for example, a local New Zealand artist versus a big international artist, I would expect there is definitely a difference for an international artist to be bigger or smaller than the New Zealand one. So these graphs might change, but I don't expect the overall one here to change. All right. So that means overall, I think, I don't have enough evidence to say that there's any difference. So my conclusion overall is that both of these bands are equally successful. Yep. So that's all I want to do is just one last concluding sentence. Um, this leads me to suggest that both bands are equally successful. Yep, I don't have evidence that they are different, so I've got evidence of a relationship, but I don't have any evidence of a difference between the two bands. All right. So that will now get me through to my excellence. All right, if you'd been able to talk about one of the graphs um, and say whether or not um, there is enough evidence of difference, that would get you achieved. Justifying it gets you through to your merit, but being able to put that whole thing together gets you through to the excellence. All good? Awesome. Okay, so that is question two. Let's have a look now at question three. So we're going to do a bit of probability, but we're also going to do a bit of time series. So, Monopoly. don't know if you guys have played Monopoly before or know the game, but on Monopoly, one of the sides of the board um, is a whole, place, a whole bunch of streets that you're going to move from one to the other. Now, we're going to have two dice, and in this particular case, we're going to have four-sided dice. All right, so... Uh, we wanted to change this from the traditional six-sided, which we know, let's make it a four-sided dice. So, the person is going to roll two dice, and then they're going to move that number of places. So the first question, calculate the probability that Kylie's first move takes her to Whitechapel Road. Okay, so on here, Whitechapel Road, where's my Whitechapel Road? Yeah. Um, so here's Whitechapel Road. Yep, so they're going to start at go, where's our starting point? And we're going to know what's the chance of getting to Whitechapel Road. So, two dice. On one of the dice, 
I could get a what? What are my possibilities? One, two, three, or four. So that's on dice number one. Dice number two, I could also get a one, two, three, and four. Um, now I can sit down and just work out the possibilities in my head, but if we were dealing with bigger situations than this, it's actually quite useful to draw a table. And I don't know if you guys have seen this. Okay, have you seen setup probability setup like this before? So these are really, really good for combination stuff. All right. So in this case, we're going to take each of the numbers and we're going to add them together. So this is dice number one here and dice number two there. If I got a one and a one, that would give me two moves. One and a two is three. One and a three is four, five. Um, three, four, five, six. <coughs> four, five, six, seven. Um, five, six, seven, eight. So that's all my possible combinations. Yep. So in order to get to Whitechapel Road, how many moves do I need? Three. So uh, to get a three, I, there's one possibility there. There's another possibility there. So there's two chances out of how many? Sixteen. So there's sixteen possible combinations in total, and so the probability is two out of sixteen. Okay. So we're just going to write probability equals two out of sixteen. And because we are year 11, we are going to simplify that fraction. If you've got a calculator, you can wait welcome to do it that way, but we do expect you to simplify it, and that should give you down to, you can write it as 1 over 8, or you can change it to a decimal if you prefer, um, 0.125, or if you want to write it as a percentage, 12.5%. Any of those is fine. All right? So the, which version you prefer is up to you. And in fact, I don't even need to see the working, but I do need the answer correct. Okay, so that's the first one, and that's just a straightforward question, so that is worth a U. Okay, so getting that is our U achieved. Okay, let's move on to something a little more harder. Um, Pablo claims that his first move is more likely to land on income tax than on Whitechapel Road. Okay, so he's saying it's more likely to land on Whitechapel, sorry, income tax, so income tax is there versus landing on Whitechapel. Yep, so that's what his claim is. And we need to investigate that claim. So how do we know whether something is more likely? How high probability? Good. So we just want to compare that. So to get to income tax, how many moves do we need to make? One, two, three, four. Got to move four times. So I'm going to jump back to my little table here. Um, but getting a four, one, two, three. There's three ways that we could get a four. Um, three different ways of rolling the dice. Two and a two, one and a three, three and a one. Yep. So therefore, the probability of a four is three out of sixteen. Yep. So I'm going to just make a little note there. The probability of getting a three is that was two out of eight. No, two out of eight, two out of sixteen. So trying to simplify half of it in my head. Probability of a 4 was 3 out of 16. And so because this is larger, the probability is larger. Um, now, for some people, and in this particular case, they're both divided by 16, so that's fine. I would, I'm personally quite happy comparing 2 over 16 with 3 out of 16. If they didn't have the same denominator, what I would recommend is turning them into decimals and comparing them as decimals. Because a lot of people prefer to they find it easier comparing decimals or percentages than comparing fractions with different denominators. All right. So um, in this particular case, same denominator, I'm happy to compare. But if they were different, I would change that to decimal first. All right. So because the chance of getting a four is larger, which one's more likely? Four, which is what income tax. Good. Putting it always back into the context. Um, so that one is larger, therefore, so those three little dots in a triangle shape mean therefore. Um, so therefore, income tax is more likely than Whitechapel. So if you're able to find the probability of a four, okay, then that would get you the achieved. If you're able to make the comparison, then that will get you the merit R. 
Yep. Good. Okay. So now I want to find, calculate the probability that two players both land on the Angel Islington. Okay, so Angel Islington is right here. So there's two parts to this question. One of them is I want to find the chance that they land on Angel Islington, but I also need to take into account that I'm talking about two players. Yeah. So when I'm talking, as soon as we see this two players, oh, you should just be able to push. Is it not okay? Yeah. Um, as soon as we see two players, and this is quite a common question, you need to know that two players mean that I'm talking about, I need to find the probability of whatever the event is for the first person, <coughs> and we need to find the probability of some event for the second person. So we're talking about person number one and person number two, and that means they this and that. And in probability, and means times. Yeah? So we need to find the probability of landing on Andor Islington, and we need to then multiply that by itself to get the probability for two players. Yeah? So to get to Angel Islington, we need one, two, three, four, five. We need to roll a six on the dice. So we need to find the probability of getting a six. Yeah? So I'm just going to jump back to my little table and the chance of a six. Um, we've got one, two, three ways that we could roll two dice and get a six. Um, so that probability is going to be three out of 16. So I can jump back to here. So that's going to mean my probability is three out of 16 times three out of 16. And three threes are nine and 16 times 16 is, I'm sure that is a great number. Where is it? Gives me 256, and I'm just going to check. I don't think 9 over 256 simplifies, but I will just double check. No, it doesn't. Good. Right, so we're going to do that as 9 over 256. All turn it to a decimal, all turn it to a fraction. Oh, percentage. Sorry. Yeah? All good. Now, that's a multi step process. Okay, we had to know um, that we were working out an and probability. So if you're able to just find 3 over 16, then that gets you your U. If you're able to get to 9 over 256, then that gets you an R. Okay? All right. So, now we need to get to our excellence level. We've got 16 chance cards in a game of Monopoly, and one of those cards reads, take a trip to King's Cross Station. So when they land on chance, yep, so when they land on chance, they're going to take a card and follow the instructions. We want to know the probability that after a player's first dice roll, they are at King's Cross Station. Okay. So, we want to get to King's Cross Station. Hmm. So, King's Cross Station means there are two ways that we could get to King's Cross Station, aren't there? Either we can roll a dice, and we'd have to roll a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so if we roll five, we'll get to King's Cross Station. Or, now I'm just going to note this, so we can either, so we can roll a five, or if you was to roll a one, two, three, four, five, six, if you're rolling a seven, and, and you then got that correct chance card, and then got, and then got the card, that would then allow you to get to King's Cross Station. So we need to remember and in probability means times or means plus. Good. So we need to find the chance of rolling a five or rolling a seven and getting the card. Yeah. So that's what I need to find. If we find any one of these parts, that's going to get us through to our achieved. Um, if we get the combination of seven and the card, 
that would get us a merit. If we get the whole answer, that's going to get us our excellence. So chance of rolling of five. Um, let me jump back to here. So the chance of rolling a five, well, there's four ways that we can get a five. Um, so the chance of a five is four out of 16. And the chance of a seven, I'm being lazy and not rewriting it, there are two chances of getting a seven. So we know that is two out of 16. And the chance of getting that right card, which says take a trip, how many, what's the chance of that? One out of 16. Yeah. So now we need to grab our trusty calculator and we're going to do 4 and 16 plus 2 and 16 times 1 and 16. And that's going to give me, and it's giving me this decimal, which is 5.2578. 0.2578p. And with probabilities, I tend to try go to 40 sole places. It's a really good habit to fall into. 40p is a good, or percentages, 2bp. Okay. All right. So if I was able to get any one of these, if I got that probability, or I got that, or I got that, then that would get me my u. If I was able to get this combination, so no 2 over 16 times 1 over 16, that would give me my R. Getting to that final one there gets me my T. Alright. All good? Nice. You guys all good? Yeah? You got a question? The probability of a pi, yes, yes. So that was, I jumped back to there and our table of all our combinations and I could get a five, hit one, two, three, four different ways. Well, your point is, is that which card is that? Is that the, I mean, which, is that the income tax? No, that would be um, landing straight on. So if I land on King's Cross itself, I will go and move one, two, three, four, five spaces and that takes me directly there. Yeah? Okay, now we need to do some time series, because we haven't done time series yet. So what we've got now is we're comparing two different versions of Monopoly. Um, so we've got the London version, which is the original Monopoly, and we are going to compare that with this one um, from um, based on Atlantic City in New Jersey in the States. All right, so that's kind of just a very generic context, really. What we've got is um, we've got a couple of graphs here, and we're looking at the temperature some weather, all right? And we've got two graphs here. Um, so we've got a graph about our mean monthly temperatures um, and we've got Atlantic City and London. So the dark blue line is Atlantic City and the purple line is London. And then underneath that, we've got the average high and low. So this is now looking at um, over the months of the year. So in this one, I've got my months of the year along this axis, whereas this one I've got the, a bunch of years with the data on there. Okay, So I'm always going to think about these axes, what the data is about first. So before I even go into the question itself, I want to just look at these data sets in general and say, right, what are some of the patterns that I need to know? So I need to know about trend. Okay, I need to know from the very first point in time to the very last point okay what is happening and when i talk about the first and last point i'm looking at the overall trend so often what i would do is i would draw a line that hits these top peaks and a line that hits these bottom peaks because that's giving me the overall view of what the pattern is going across because then i would draw a trend line through the middle that just kind of hits through the middle of those points and that's the trend line that I want to interpret. So I want to look from the start to the end, is that trend going up, is it going down, is it staying stable? All right. This particular one, from 2009 to 2018, the temperatures look fairly stable to me. Yep. So that's, what I, that's the kind of thing I want to identify for trend. Seasonality is the second 
pattern that I want to identify. And that's when we would particularly look at that second graph, but we can see it in the first graph. So seasonality, do you know what seasonality is? Yeah, our seasons. And it's talking about a pattern that repeats every year or every certain time period. It might be a weekly pattern, it might be a monthly pattern, but there's a pattern that repeats consistently. And so when I look at the graph here, I can see that the graph goes up and down and up and down and consistently every year it's following that same pattern up and down and up and down. So that tells me in this graph when looking at temperatures, I do have a seasonality pattern. Okay, so that's the first thing is does it exist? Because not every data set has a seasonality pattern. All right. In this case, we definitely have some kind of seasonality pattern. Then within that seasonality pattern, I want to look and see which one um, is, where is it highest and where is it lowest? And again, coming back to that excellence, telling the story. So achieved, tell me what the pattern is. When is it high, when is it low? Merit, justify it. Excellence, tell me the story behind it. Okay, so what do you guys know about um, weather in the States? It's more intense than the snow, but the opposite from the snow. Absolutely. So we're in coming up late spring, early summer at the moment. So over in the States at the moment, it's going to be the opposite. So instead of at the moment, our temperatures are getting higher, their temperatures will be getting lower. Yep. Good. Now I'm just going to rub those out for a second. Um, the particular question, um, and I haven't looked at the second graph yet, which I will in a second, the particular question here says, which city has more variation in November? So they're looking at a very specific time period. So they're saying in November. So we want to just label off the November part. So that's why I can't look at that first graph, because that's hard to see November exactly there. But the second graph, I can. So I know November goes in this range there. All right. So I want to just look at the data in that range and say which one is more variable. Now what does that mean, more variable? Yeah, there's, there's more changes. So if it's more variable, that means the highs and the low, the, the distance between the high and the low, is bigger. All right. So if I was to look at, um, so my red line is the London. So London, there's the lowest temperature in, in there and the highest. So that's your average high, average low temperatures for the month. All right. So we can see that if I look at how wide that bar is there, that is the variation in, in November. For Atlantic City, I've got the line at the top and for the average highs and the average lows down the bottom. And I want to look at how wide that bar is. Yep. Which of those is more variable? Atlantic City. Yep. So that's all I need to be able to identify for this part. Just a straight achieve question. We're identifying that variation as the distance between it and there's more variation within the Atlantic City. Okay, so which one has more? Atlantic City. Okay. So that will give me the achieved. But then it says use statistical reasoning. So, I need to put some statistical ideas in this. Yeah. So, this is where I need to explain or justify or give evidence of that. Yeah. So, how do I know that there was more variation? Absolutely. The difference between the highs and lows in Atlantic City was greater than the difference between the highs and lows for um, London. Yep. So, that's my justification. All right. So, Atlantic City because um, the difference between the, um, what's the wording I've used there, the average high, the average high temperatures and average low temperatures is greater, larger, wider, okay, slash more variable um, than the difference for um, London. Okay, 
Now, in that sentence, I've made sure it's in context. So I've specifically said that a graph is talking about the average high temperatures, average low temperatures. So I want to make sure I do do that. Okay. For the second part of the sentence, I just said for the difference for London, because I've already said before what the difference is. So I don't need to repeat that again. All right. But I have defined it there once in that sentence. All right. So being able to tell me Atlantic City is my U. Being able to give me justification is my merit. So that's that question. Then we need the next question is going to be able to talk about that trend and that seasonality that I started talking about before. All right. And so what I get in the habit of doing when I look at these questions is before I even go and read the questions, I look at the graphs and write down what the key features are of each graph. So if it's a bivariate, I sit if it's a bivariate graph, I just sit there and I write, you know, linear, nonlinear, positive, negative, etc. And then I look at the questions that come after it and decide which question wants me to say, write all that stuff down. But I know that I need to write that stuff down anyway. So if you're in an exam, and this is a technique, if you sit there and you don't quite know what the question's asking, as soon as you see time series, you know you have to talk about trend and um, seasonality. Have to. So even if you write it in the wrong question, we will give you the marks for being able to tell us that. If it's in the wrong place, doesn't matter, you've told us that, that's what we want to know. Okay, um, so when I look at these two, I need to think about um, what that overall trend is. So I need to draw an overall trend. So the overall trend for Atlantic City, if I try to draw that line halfway between those highs and lows, is around about there. Okay, what I need to do is I need to talk about a starting point and an ending point to give me some evidence. All right, so I can read off and say that's there is an average of around about 12, 13 degrees. Yep. So for in the beginning of the data, now that will be 2009, that little line here. So this is end of 2008. Yep. So at the end of 2008, the average or the trend is about 12 or 13 degrees by my end of my data, which in this case is 2018, later in 2018, the average or the trend is still about 12 or 13 degrees. All right. So first of all, I just want to say overall, there's a stable pattern. That's my achieved. My merit, I need to give the years and that those trend values to go with them. All right. So that's what I want to do. Um, so trend. Um, overall, from... Um, the end of um, 2008 until um, end of 2018, the um, average temperatures in now the blue line is Atlantic City. Atlantic City is stable at around 12 degrees. And I think it's in Celsius, they haven't explicitly said, but I'm assuming that's not in Fahrenheit. Because Fahrenheit, that would be below zero. Okay, so that's just my overall statement that will get me through to my achieved. Yep. Now I need to turn that into a merit, so I need to justify it. I need the evidence to go with it. Okay, um, so I can literally say my evidence, or I can just say because. My evidence is that the average trend value um, in, oh, at the end of, at the end of 2008, is approximately 12 degrees Celsius and at the end of 2018 it is um, again around 12 degrees Celsius. Yep. Okay. So that means that over the last 10 years 
the average temperature in Atlantic City is pretty stable on here. Right? There hasn't been some any massive changes in the average temperatures. Okay. Then I need to do the same for um, London. Yep. So now I need to look at the red lines and I need to think, right, where is the top of those red peaks? Where is the bottom of those red peaks? And then I want to draw a line somewhere in the middle of those. Okay. So this one, I would accept either a slight increase, it would only be for a slight increase, or I would accept it being stable. Okay. So with data like this, I, there are, like with the shape, there are sometimes a couple of different things I will accept. Um, but it also comes back to your justification. So um, that's what I want to say now is that um, for London temperatures, um, the average um, is stable at around, I need to figure out what that number is. Going to be about the same, slightly higher, slightly lower, maybe slightly lower, I think. Mm, it's hard to tell you. It's very hard to tell. Um, I'm going to I'm going to put down 11 degrees. Okay. And this is again when we come to mark this. They what we usually have in the marking schedule is they'll have a range that they'll accept. So they won't accept if you write five degrees. Yep, that's way too low. But if you did it anywhere between probably about 10 and 14, yep, that's what that's they would sort of we give a range in the marking schedule except from this to this. Okay. Um, because, and then I'm going to put dot, 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 I'm really lazy, I'm not going to write the rest of that sentence. Same as above, because end of 2008, the average is this, end of 2018, the average is still around about that. Yep, my justification. Okay. Now, the question says compare. So I need to compare these trends. So tell me about them. Are they about the same? Are they different? What would you conclude? They're about the same. Yep. Um, so in that case, that's what I want to have as an overall conclusion. Um, so for both cities, the average temperatures are approximately the same and both are stable. Um, from 2008 till 2018. Yeah, so now I've got a comparison in there. Okay, so that's my trend. Now I need to talk about the seasonality. Yep. So I need to identify when it's high, when it's low. All right. So that's when we're in the graph, we're looking, first of all, we're identifying, is there a seasonal pattern? So that's my very first thing that I want to talk about. Okay. Seasonality. So when I look at the graphs, is there a seasonality pattern? Yeah, definitely. There's a pattern that repeats every year without fail. Um, so that's the first thing I want to know, and that's true of both Atlanta and London. Yep, both of those have repeating patterns. So that's my very first sentence, so I've identified that there is one. Um, there is a consistent repeating pattern for, um, for both Atlantic City and London, therefore, um, seasonality is present. <coughs> yep, that's always the first thing I want to do is verify is there a seasonal pattern. 
now I need to describe that particular pattern. So I want to, in particular, the most interesting points of the graph of time series is always where is it highest, where is it lowest. In actual fact, come with the graph itself, there's lots of descriptions that we will accept. Okay, being able to describe how the temperature rises here and drops there and rises. So being able to describe the overall pattern or finding a couple of particular interesting points talking about them, those are all things that we accept. All right. So I want to know where is it at its highest. Yep, so it's at its highest. Oh gosh, that was like a terrible straight line. Let me try and... Nope, still can't get a straight line. Let me try again. Kind of, sort of. So there is about our highest. Yep, and our lowest is just after the turn of the year. Yep, so the lowest point is usually is probably around about February, and the highest would probably be around about what month would we call that? July, August, somewhere slightly just past midway. So when I look at a one-year block, it's kind of just it's a little bit past. Uh, mid year, same with like the Jan the February, it's just a little bit past that. So we know that the lowest is going to be the lowest average temperatures are in about February, and the highest average temperatures are around about August. Yep. So we never know to give a range. Yep. With the with the February one, I would if I look at most of the years, yep, if I look at most of those points. They're either right on January or just in February. So we would accept either January or February. Yep, for the lowest points. For the highest points, they are, because of the way the grid is, it's not as easy to read off. So when we look at those highest points, and they do vary a little bit, they can sometimes, the red line and green line, sorry, the red and the blue lines could be slightly different in terms of their peaks. So again, there's a couple of months there that we will accept um, in the answers. Yep. Normally we try to give you guys graphs that are really clear to make that easier for you, but sometimes we keep graphs that aren't quite so tidy. Yep, and then we have to accept that in the answers. So we're not going to penalise you for the graph. Um, so seasonality, so we've got a consistent repeating pattern. Um, the average temperature in both cities um, is usually notice this the wording i'm always being a little bit i'm never saying it is i can prove it i'm saying i'm this is what i'm seeing it's generally a roundabout so from some of those words showing this uncertainty okay so the average temperature in both cities is usually um, in february um, and highest in um, august That statement there is achieved. Yep, because I haven't given any evidence of that yet. I've just made a statement. All right, I've compared it. I've said that the, the temperatures are highest and lowest about the same time of year. So that's a comparison sentence. But now I need the evidence to back that up. So that's when I need to look at um, these high and low points. Um, what I want to do is I want to literally find the highest for Atlanta. Yep, that is around about 25 degrees. Yep, the lowest for Atlanta is around about zero, sometimes a little bit higher, but around about zero. So there's my evidence of the pattern for Atlanta, is that it drops to, down, to around about zero degrees um, in February and rises up to about... Um, 25 degrees in August. Yep. So I'm so in Atlantic City, um, the average temperature rises to around 25 degrees in August and drops to around zero degrees in February. Yep. Find the same kind of evidence for my um, London, highs and low. It's highest at this temperature, lowest at this temperature. So I'm matching up that same value. Okay. 
And then I want to tell the story. So why would it be high in August? Why is it going to be low in February? Yeah, which seasons? Be, is, be, we need to be specific. So it's going to be low in... Absolutely, yep. Um, so I'm going to, I need to talk about the London ones. I'm just going to put dot, dot, dot. Um, but then in terms of telling the story, we're going to say um, temperatures will be highest in August because this is towards the end of summer. And so by the end of summer, you'll be in the highest temperatures. It's not usually the beginning of summer, like at the moment, we're at the beginning of summer, but we're not at our highest temperatures yet. Just talking days like this that are pretty cold. Yep. So it's the end of summer that gives the highest temperatures, and same with the end of winter gives you the lowest temperatures. Um, because that is at the end of summer, um, and temperatures will be lowest in February because that is the end of summer. Sorry, the end of winter. Alright. So that gets me through to my excellence. Alright, so I want to be comparative, but I need to talk about both the trend and the seasonality. The other one that I can talk about um, as an extra one is I can talk about variation and compare the variation. All right. So if I looked at, and this is only when I'm comparing two data, two data sets, when I look at the blue lines and the red lines, do you guys notice that the blue lines, the peaks are higher and the troughs are lower, so it's a much wider graph, whereas the Atlantic City, no, London ones, um, the red lines are narrower. It's a narrower pattern. So that means that in terms of the variation over the entire year, Atlantic City has much higher highs and lower lows, and London has less variation in their data, so less scatter. Yep. So that's another comment that we can talk about. Sometimes they'll explicitly ask you that. The previous question only specifically asked about variation in November, but if I was comparing variation overall, then that's what I would be looking for, is comparing highs and the lows across the whole data set. Okay, um, so that is something that we could also add there, is the variation. Um, and that Atlantic City um, has more variable temperatures. Um, than London. Because, and that's when we could talk about the difference. The difference between the maximum and minimum um, is about 25 degrees versus about, I think the other one's about 15 degrees. All right. And that's getting us right through the whole exam. So, the question that I have for you guys.